também coautor de Deep Freeze, Iceland's Economic Collapse, em tradução livre, congelamento profundo, ah, o colapso econômico da Islândia. Eu vou chamar o palco agora, Philip Bagos. Please. Good morning to everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I, I'm really surprised that so many people are here in such, such, such a, with such a stage. I feel like a pop star. I'm a little, I'm a little bit intimidated by all that. But uh, it's uh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, I w would like to talk today about the tragedy of the year, which is also the title of my book. That was, I was surprised by, by its success. Until now, we have um, an English edition, American English, British, e British English, Italian, German, Dutch, Slovak, Polish, Bulgarian, Romanian, Finnish, Greek, Spanish, European Portuguese, and finally, also Brazilian Portuguese. Uh, so I'm very happy. Uh, and uh, well, there's a French one and a Russian also on, on their way. Well, in my book, I approach the euro from uh, two sides. I make a political analysis of the history of the euro and combine it with an economic analysis of its uh, monetary setup. Uh, and only if you combine these two sides, you actually get a picture of where the euro comes from and where it may go. A picture of the real euro as it is, and not a picture of a ideal euro of uh, Nirvana land. So I, I start with uh, the two opposing views, uh, visions for Europe, the libertarian and the socialist vision, um, that have played an important role in the history uh, of Europe and mankind, of course, also. Um, the founding fathers of the European Union, where Schumann, Konrad Adenauer, Alcide de Gaspari, that by the way uh, were speaking German mm, with each other and were all Catholics, they were closer to this libertarian vision. Mm? Uh, it's just a tendency, but they were closer to this vision. They were still influenced by, by the experiences of World War II, and they thought that uh, to have peace in, in Europe, we, you would need free trade. Um, the most fundamental Christian and uh, European value for them is individual liberty. Um, in their vision, there's a Europe of sovereign states that defend private property rights with open borders and a free exchange of capital goods, ideas, and uh, persons. And this side, the libertarian side, had a, an important victory in 1957 with the Treaty of Rome that was signed that guaranteed the four the four liberties, for the so-called four liberties, the free movement of goods, services, capital, and uh, persons. Even though already in the beginning there was some influence from the socialist side because uh, they were also signed the, the CAP, the Common Agriculture Policy, that is basically central planning in agriculture that was introduced um, by um, pressure from the French government that basically said, well, you get free trade if we get subsidies for, for farmers. So, but this, it was basically a, a victory for, for this side that wanted to back, bring back what classical liberalism had already achieved in the 19th century and that what, what had been lost during uh, two world wars in the age of nationalism, nationalism and socialism. The libertarian side says, well, for harmonic cooperation in Europe and worldwide, you only need uh, uh, liberty, you don't need a European super state. Um, so this, this vision is obviously opposed to a European su super state uh, that, that is seen as a danger for liberty and the only central institution that you might need would be a European central court that defends the four liberties and s resolves conflicts between nations. The other side, the socialist side is presented, the socialist or empire side is presented by uh, personalities like Jacques Delors or François Mitterrand, and they are backed by a coalition of nationalists, socialists, social democrats of all parties. They want Europe to be an empire or a fortress that is protectionist to the outside and interventionist to the inside. They dream of a central European state 
directed by technocrats, and I suppose in their dreams they are those technocrats. Um, the empire controls the periphery, and the sovereign states basically stop to exist, there's central legislation, a uh, super state, there's redistribution between regions, there's regulation and harmonization of tax rates, of course always on the highest level, and the vast majority of the political class of, of the bureaucrats, interest groups, lobbies, and subsidized sector s support this vision, want the central state as a means to enrich themselves. Well, the empire of socialist vision is nothing new. Charles the Great, Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, they all wanted to um, found an empire in Europe, a central government in Europe via military means. Now the means are a little less violent there using political means now. And the tactics is typically what Robert Hicks uh, always describes, using crisis situation to increase the power of the central institution and uh, create new institutions. So we see this in the sovereign debt crisis in Europe also now. So commission behaves as if, the U European Commission behaves as if Greece, Portugal and Ireland would be their protectorates, they tell them how to reduce the deficits, which taxes to increase. Um, the ECB has expanded its power as well. It has started to buy government bonds uh, outright on the secondary market. It has expanded its balance sheet. There are new ex institutions found, have been founded, the EFSF and the ESM, the European Stabilization Mechanism. So. There's this fight in history between the two visions, the libertarian and the socialist side, um, because obviously they are opposed, because more power for the central state means less individual liberty. So who is on which side in this battle? Well, traditionally, the Christian democratic parties are closer to the libertarian side, and countries like the Netherlands, Germany, and uh, think of Ludwig Erhard, and Great Britain, think of Margaret Thatcher, they are closer to the libertarian side. While on the other side are the socialist parties, the social democratic parties, normally under the leadership uh, of, of the Fran French government. The, the, in the, actually, the case of France is key to understand uh, the, uh, the history of the European Union. After the humiliation of 1940 and the loss of its colonies, the French political class, the French political elite, looked for a substitute for its lost empire, and it wanted to find it in, in Europe. Uh, moreover, the French political elite wanted to prevent that Germany would recuperate its natural weight in the heart of Europe and get back the lost territories uh, in the World War. So the idea was, was to absorb in some way Germany into a socialist European Union under the leadership of France. So the, the battle between the two sides goes on and it looks like um, after the first victory of the libertarian side, the socialist vision, vision will win because the European budget um, increases continuously. There are ever more regulations, harmonizations, there's also an implicit tendency for centralization in the EU because the, the laws are proposed by the EU Commission, that is like, like the government is proposing the, the laws, not the parliament, and then the parliament can only say yes or no, we grant you more power or not. So it seems that the socialist side is, is winning, but then one unexpected event happens, one predicted by Ludwig von Mises 70 years ago, the Berlin Wall falls, communism collapses. And this changes the scenario completely. Why? What does it mean for the fight in Europe? Well, for one, after reunification, Germany would increase in, in power, and Germany was closer to the libertarian side. And the states of the East, Czechoslovakia, po Poland, Hungary, they wanted to join also the European Union. And of course, they were, they were tired of uh, socialism, communism, uh, and super states. So they would obviously join the libertarian side. 
So the balance of power between the two sides were, were about to tip against the socialists. What did they do as a reaction? Well, first, they prevented a fast extension of the EU eastwards, because these, these countries wanted to join as fast as possible, and, and, and Thatcher and Genscher actually wanted to join them also as fast as possible. But the socialist side thought if, if, they, if, they let the, if they, we let them in very, east, very fast, very quickly, then the EU will degenerate, as they called it, into a free trade zone only. So they prevented the fast extension eastwards, and they accelerated their pressure towards centralization. And the means towards the centralization was the common currency, the euro. So the fall of the Berlin Wall provided a unique possibility for the French political class to get rid of the discipline imposed by the Bundesbank. Why did the Bundesbank impose discipline on Europe? Because um, when the uh, Bundesbank, the Bundesbank did not inflate very much its currency. So if the French wanted to have a stable currency with the D-Mark, they could not inflate much either. They had to inflate also not very much. Otherwise, they would devalue. They would have to devalue. That is very embarrassing. That is a smoking gun for the population, that there's inflation going on, that the politicians did something wrong. So if they wanted to, have to maintain stable exchange rates, um, then they had to follow the monetary policy of the Bundesbank that was relatively less inflationary. What does it mean? That means that Fra France has less inflation than in bonds. That means the Fren French National Bank can finance less government spending than they want. That is, indirectly, the Bundesbank, by its restrictive monetary policy, is restricting French government spending. The losers of the war are restricting public spending of the winners. Why was the Bundesbank so conservative? Well, basically because of the, <laughs> the errors made by German monetary policy in the 20th century. And because uh, twice uh, in a hyperinflation, 1923 and, and 48 in the monetary reform, German savers lost basically everything. So Germans were and asked very opposed to inflation and even though German politicians always pressured the Bundesbank to inflate more, they couldn't win in this battle because if, if they did, if they threatened to touch the independence of the Bundesbank, they would lose elections. So no government dared to touch the independence of the Bundesbank, which was putting a limit for French inflation and French government spending that had to be reduced in their view. That's an inter interesting anecdote uh, from the end of the 1980s where the, there's a re reunion or meeting of French and German diplomats um, where the Germans want to speak about short-range nuclear bombs that France uh, had stationed near the German border that could only ex explode in, in Germany. They said, well, this is an awkward si si situation for us. Can we do something about this short-range nuclear weapons? And, they, and then the French responded, well, let's talk first about the German atomic bomb. And uh, innocent Germans replied, uh, well, you know that we are not allowed to have an atomic bomb and we don't have one. And then the French said, well, we mean the D mark, the German mark, the German currency. So you see the, the French political elite saw this economic power in f uh, sim symbolized by the currency as a threat to them. So when the Berlin Wall came down, uh, there was a possibility to accelerate, uh, there were plans for the for common currency before to accelerate uh, this, and, uh, and in fact, in September 2010, archives were opened, and already many witnesses ha had said so. But now it's official that François Mitterrand actually demanded the single currency in exchange for his permission to German reunification. Well, you might ask why, why would Germany need the French permission? Well, if you consider the situation in 1989, Germany was still occupied by the three, by the four allies. Um, it was militarily vastly inferior to, to France. Mitterrand, for example, implicitly, implicitly threatened by saying, if we don't step forward with European integration now, 
we will have the same situation as in 1913. So one year before the First World War, when Germany was uh, isolated with, with two front war. So Kohl was, Kohl was actually happy to, to give that up. That was the end of the d mark that was an, which was an important victory for the so socialist side. Why? Because the euro provoked sovereign debt crisis that then can be used for centralization of political and fiscal power uh, in Europe. And actually, the end of the euro would be the end of the socialist vision in the short and midterm, at least. And that's why politicians will do everything, anything, to defend um, the euro. Well, this, this for, well, this more for the history, political history. So now to the question, why did uh, high inflation countries want, wanted the euro? Well, the first one I already explained. They wanted to get rid of the discipline of the Bundesbank. They would also receive the prestige of the Bundesbank for the new common currency. For example, the, the European Central Bank is, is is p was put in Frankfurt as a symbol that it would be as, as good as the Bundesbank, so you would get a strong currency. Signorage, yeah, Signorage is actually the profit from central bank money production. Uh, central banks have profits, profits be because they have assets. They, they for, for example, they give loans to, to banks and then they receive interests and then they have profits at the end of the year. And how, th how are the profits shared in the Eurozone? Well, all the central banks send uh, their profits in a common pool and then they are distributed back. How? Well, if they would be distributed in terms, uh, in function of the assets, then every central bank would get the same back as they paid in. So it's, it's not. Um, it's distributed in function of a number calculated by population and GDP. And unsurprisingly, in this redistributional process, Germany, Germany loses and France wins. Well, lower interest rates, high inflation country would get lower interest rates by the euro what, for two reasons. First, uh, the risk premium on sovereign debt would be reduced because the euro, euro was interpreted as a political project. That means if bad came to way worse or in, in, in a very bad situation, other, other EU, uh, Euro countries would bail out um, mm. countries in, in difficulties. Uh, uh, that was an expectation that, we, as we now know, is true. So the, the risk premium for, uh, in the interest rates was reduced for, for these countries, and also inflationary expectations came down because it was thought that the European Central Bank would be as conservative as the Bundesbank. So th this me meant that some countries had to pay much less interest on their debts. Uh, Italy, for example. Um, uh, so that, that meant there was additional room for government spending. Another, another um, advantage, so to speak, is was an excuse for austerity measures. At the beginning of the 1990s, Countries like uh, Belgium and Italy had much more than 100% uh, debt uh, per G G uh, GDP. So they were already on the verge of bankruptcy. And they had to do some reforms. And now they could put the euro as an excuse. They could say, tell their population that uh, we have to do these reforms to get into the euro, into the holy land. And once we are in, then we will be in paradise. So you have, to, um, uh, you, have, you have to support us in this, right? something that they would have had to do in any case t if they didn't want to default. There's only also monetary redistribution, as I will show you that most of the new created money went into the high inflation countries. And finally, um, these countries would get a stronger currency, that means cheaper imports and a higher standard of living. Before the euro, um, uh, Germany that had less inflation than the other countries, hardworking, saving pe population with capital, 
accumulation, increase in productivity, more exports. So there was a tendency that the DMARC was appreciating. And that meant that the benefits of the hard work of the pro productivity increase w would be spread to the whole population that could import cheaper or go on vacation cheaper to Greece or Italy. So the standard of living was continuously increasing by the appreciation of the exchange rate. Now this does not work anymore with the euro, even though there's hard working population and, sa and saving. Um, the tendency for a stronger currency is comp compensated by uh, by the behavior in, in the high inflation countries in southern Europe. So the benefits of uh, the hardworking German population are spread to all over Europe. And the cheaper imports coupled with the lower interest rates led to a consumption and construction boom in the European periphery. Okay, here are some graphs to, uh, to, back, to back these points up. Uh, here you see the interest rates on, on government debt. Uh, wait. As I told you, it was reduced in the periphery. This red line is Germany, and you see that they are approaching when it when it's becomes obvious who will join the euro and who, who, who don't they approach the German level because the risk premium is reduced and the inflationary expectations are reduced. You see that here's, here's still a difference to the Greek one because it's, in 1998 it was not clear when Greek would, Greece would falsify the statistics to get into the euro. Um, so the, uh, Greece only joined the euro in 2002 or one. Uh, so there's still a difference, but they are converging. Here you see the balance, balance of trade. You see that um, the export surplus of Germany that has a tendency to make the currency stronger is compensated by import surpluses of, the, of southern Europe. And you see that, that this tendency actually over time has increased. So there was a continuous uh, import surplus by the southern Europe, something that would not have been possible without the euro. Here you see that uh, actually uh, the euro was used um, in the periphery or southern European countries to generously increase wages. This is productivity or competitiveness based, uh, calculated or based on unit labor costs. So if this goes up, your competitiveness goes down. So all, all these countries got less competitive so they had, uh, they lived beyond their means. Generous rate increases, while in Germany, that is the green line, you see that competitiveness actually increased. Wage, cr wage increases were, were lower. So for the standard of living in Germany, <laughs> when the euro came, it was basically flat. You, here you see retail sales so as a proxy for consumption. So it's basically flat standard of living in Germany stagnated uh, in the last 15 years, while in the US, France, and the UK it, it increased. Or if you take the example of Spain, in only eight years it, it increases retail sales more than 20 percent. So now the question is obvious, why with all these disadvantages did Germany approve the euro? euro? Why did it say yes? to the pr project. Well, oh, well, here's monetary redistribution. There you see that this is in M3, growth of M3, and you see the big, thick um, blue line is Germany, which is mostly um, lower than the increase in uh, Southern Europe. So why, why said Germany yes to the euro? Well, first of all, the population, many economists and lawyers were against it. But German elites, political elites and business elites wanted it. And the first reason I already told you that Mitterrand uh, demanded 
the common currency in exchange for reunification. And of course, German politicians also wanted to get rid of the Bundesbank, uh, which was, and the euro was a means to it. Many politicians in Germany are also socialists, so they wanted the socialist vision to go on, and harmonization of tax rates, etc. There are also many interest, interest groups that wanted the socialist vision to go on because they wanted a harmonization of regulation. Environmental regula regulation, for example, in Germany is very high, so if the socialist vision goes on, you can impose it on the other European countries uh, and benefit from that. Big exporters also. We're in favor of the euro because with the euro, the Italy and Spain, they cannot devalue anymore. So the pressure to innovate uh, will fall. Why, why, oh, let, let me say here that even though the, the DMARC increased, uh, appreciated, um, before the euro all the time, German exports were, were actually rising. Why? Because they could import cheaper uh, raw materials and energy. Interest rates were, were lower than in other countries. And they were more in innovative. And here, I would also talk about another issue that is, I he hear many times that Germany is a great benefiter from the euro because they have so, so high exports. If you think about it, if you break it down to a single person, uh, what, is, what is really important? Exports are imports. When I'm exporting, like if I'm working, or if I sell my suit or my laptop, and then I'm exporting. Uh, when I get a haircut or I, buy, I buy, or I buy a car, I'm importing. So if someone would ask me, Philip, do you only want to import or only want to export? What would I say? Well, I would say I only want to import. Um, and this is, what, this is what, what Southern Europe actually did. Or there was a tendency that they did that. So if there are people tell me that Germany is a great benefiter from the euro, uh, I have to laugh. Well, banks also, as I, as I told you, some, some states uh, like Belgium and Italy, they were already on the verge of bankruptcy. And if they would go bankrupt, they would take down their banking systems with them. This might uh, cause problems for other European banks also German banks, so uh, in order to prevent or to, to delay this sovereign and financial collapse, German banks were also in favor of the euro. Okay, now we get a little bit more technical. So how do governments actually finance their spending uh, in Europe? In the Eurozone, as you know, taxes are not very popular. So it's when governments spend more than they receive in taxes, they issue paper and write government bonds on it. Then the banking system buys a large part of these bonds. Uh, then the banking system goes with these bonds to the ECB and say, hello, <laughs> I have here collateral. Would you give me a, a loan? and they receive a loan from the ECB. They get new reserves, and with the new reserves, they can en engage in the very profitable business of credit expansion. So this is a nice way for governments to finance themselves, just by money creation. Uh, but you would say, well, but they have to pay interest. OK, this is true. The governments have to pay interest on their bonds. Well, and then banks have to pay interest on their loans from the ECB. But then the ECB pays the profits back to the government. So it's a very nice way to finance yourself. I would love to be able to do that. Well, so you, have never, you never have to pay the debt. If the bond comes to you, you just issue, issue new ones. So this is like the bank holdings of government debt in the EU. Uh, Eurozone, that's two trillion are held by banks. That is almost 30%. This surely has gone up, this number. Uh, who holds the rest? Well, investment funds and, and other central banks. So this is not really special, because in the US, for example, it works similarly. That um, well, The difference is basically that the Fed buys the government bonds, which is, at the end, it's the same, because 
if the ECB just gives a loan uh, for a collateral, then as long as the ECB rolls over the loan, it's li like buying. Uh, the money supply is, or the reserves are increased as long as it's rolled over. In the case of the Fed, is the money supply is increased as long as the Fed does not sell the government bond. Well, so now, but the, but the difference here is that not one government can do that, but several independent governments can finance in this well. Takes the example, like let's say Greece has a deficit, for spends more than it receives in taxes, for the difference it prints government bonds, the banks buy these bonds, takes these bonds and go to the ECB, and receives more reserves, so the banks can increase the money supply, expand credits, money supply increases and prices rise. But not only in Greece, but also in France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and all of the Eurozone. So here we have a redistribution. The first receivers of the new money, that is the Greek government and the people who receive them from them, they buy at the old low prices, and when the money spreads, they win. And when the money spreads, prices go up, and other people see prices rise faster than their income, and they lose. And this is true not only for the Greek governments, the Spanish, the Portuguese governments, they all can try, tr can try to um, benefit the, uh, themselves in this way. And what is important? You actually can, can only benefit yourselves when you have a higher deficit than the rest. I called it a tragedy of the commons uh, because it's like a tragedy of the commons. Li the, the typical example are schools of fish in the ocean that are not, not owned, they are not owned by anyone. Everyone can fish the fishes. So what is the incentive for the fishers? Well, to fish as much as possible because if I don't fish the fishes, the others will. Mm, um, the effect is uh, there's an over-exploitation of the resource uh, that tends to disappear. And here it's the same. All governments in the Eurozone can exploit a commonly owned resource that is the purchasing power of the Euro in the way that they print government bonds that are then are financed by the uh, Euro system. And in the same way as the fishers only profit if they fish faster than the others, here's the same. Let's imagine that Germany has a deficit of 3% of GDP, and the rest of the Eurozone has a deficit of 10% of GDP. Okay, there are much government bonds are issued, and the banks buy them, they go to the ECB, it's financed, and the money supply increases and prices rise. Let's say prices rise 8% on average. This means that the German government, even though it has a deficit of 3%, may actually lose in the sense that real government spending may actually fall because prices are rising faster 8% than the deficit. So you see, it's the perverse incentive is you only profit if you have a higher deficit than the other countries. And it's a, com it's a tragedy of the euro, it's a tragedy of the commerce because property rights and money are not defended its public money. It's like a printing press with several owners. Look, if, if we would have here a printing press uh, to print dollars and every one of us could use it, well, those people, those per these persons would win that would print most of it or as fast as possible while the others would lose. You would only win if you pr print the dollars past us as the others because when the others start printing them, prices go up and even though you print a little bit, the prices rise faster than you print. So the first users can externalize the cost on their deficits on all other users of the euro in form of a loss in purchasing power. So the Greek government, if it has a deficit higher than the others, it can externalize the costs on the users of the euro. And many users of the euro are, non, are not voting in Greece. So the, the the great thing for the politician is that I can buy votes uh, by deficit spending and the costs are externalized in, pa externalized in part of onto people in Germany that do not vote for me. 
So the incentive is to print as much as possible because otherwise the others would do it. Of course, there are some technical li limits to it, like the banks may not buy the government bonds or the ECB may, may not accept, accept them. The, the ECB might say, okay, bank, 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 even though you come to me with this collateral, I don't give you more loans, or the rating is not high enough. But investors said, more or less, the ECB, they will, the pressure will be so high that they will always accommodate it, the demand, which, is, uh, which actually is, is true. The ECB has lowered its, its rating requirements to accept Greek government bonds, even though they uh, rated junk or Portuguese or Irish, and uh, they, the ECB accept unlimited, unlimited collateral for new loans. There's another limit for this strategy of the commons. Similarly, as in the ocean with the schools of fish, where governments intervene via regulation, they say, for example, okay, we don't want to, the fishes to disappear over exploitation of the resource, so we put a limit, uh, a quota. So they name 10 fishers and they say you can fish so many tons per year. The same happens here with the printing press, with the euro. There are some fishers named, the governments that can exploit the resource up to a limit that is 3% of GDP, the stability and growth pact that limited uh, the exploitation of the resource to 3% deficit of GDP. But it was a total failure. Many countries had more than 3% of GDP deficit and nothing happened. Germany, also France. Uh, in 2010, all countries had high, more than 3% and nothing happens. Only two, Luxembourg and Finland, had, had lower. So it was basically the never penalties because the sinners were their own judges and they decided, decided to, okay, we sin, but it's not, it's not a big deal. There will be no, no penalty. So as this limit for the tragedy of the euro is a failure, and the euro still is self-destructing and provokes accumulation of uh, debts via deficits and sovereign debt crisis that then are used for centralization. The euro also generates conflicts. Um, free trade generates peace because you are in contact with, with each other. Germans export cards in exchange for feta cheese to, to Greece. People depend on each other. There's, there are mutually beneficial exchanges. But in the European Union, this free flow, voluntary flow of goods is disturbed in several ways. There's not only the redistribution, we are regional funds and social funds, but there's also the monetary redistribution. Let's take the example for, or, of Greece. The Greek government pays high subsidies to keep an economy rolling that is uncompetitive. Uh, too high wages, strong labor unions, inflexible labor markets. Normally, this would cause a huge unemployment, but uh, this, uh, the, the consequences of this unemployment are alleviated by government spending. The government pays subsidies to the unemployed, hires the unemployed in the public sector that was increasing, increasing, increasing or it sends them in early pension schemes. But of course, this, this is very expensive. It costs much money, so what they, do they do? They have a deficit, they print their government bonds, they live beyond, beyond their means, and maintain their uncompetitiveness in this way. The bonds are bought by, by the banking system and monetized and prices rise all over Europe. So the new money goes first to the Greek government, to the minister, for example, and he buys a German car, the money goes to Germany, it doesn't flow back because price, Greece is not competitive. Uh, and it stays in Germany and the prices go up there and there's a trade deficit as a consequence. Mm, Greece has a trade deficit uh, with Germany. But you cannot maintain this forever, the accumulation of debts. And uh, so in 2010, Greek debts were so high that Greece needed a bailout, and the loans to Greece are guaranteed to large extent by, to Germany. 
And this made the redistribution, the monetary redistribution that was going on for a long time, more obvious. Most people don't understand the monetary redistribution. But finally, if you have loans, they are guaranteed by, by the German government. It makes more obvious, and the Germans got upset. Why would we subsidize the, German, uh, the Greek welfare state, pay for longer Greek vacations than we have, or higher pensions? So they got angry, and the Greek media shot back, saying that we want reparations. Uh, for the Second World War. So the, the harmonious cooperation of free trade that could exist in Europe is disturbed by this monetary redistribution. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are burning Merkel dolls in, in Athens um, in violent protests. Not that I am principally opposed to burning Merkel dolls. If I would have one, I would probably do the same. But it is more appro appropriate for Germans to burn Merkel dolls than for Greeks that are benefiting from her uh, fateful political uh, actions. It's naive to think that the euro was introduced to lower transaction costs or to end monetary nationalism uh, as a quasi gold standard and was introduced f for as a step towards more centralization uh, in Europe. And we have uh, basically three possibilities for the future. One is the optimistic one, uh, a reform of the stability and growth pact, uh, harsh austerity measures and structural reforms in, in the periphery and also a lowering of living standards there. The question is if this is uh, politically viable. Uh, second option is that um, Germany says enough is enough, and we go out of the euro, we don't want to pay anymore. Um, this is far away because all political parties are in favor and the media. It's maybe also the, that Greece uh, in a suicidal move um, decides to leave the euro. Mm. Or the third option is that we go advance on, this, on, the, on the road that we are on is towards the transfer union and centralization that the more responsible, responsible governments uh, pay, uh, pay continuously to the less responsible governments. Euro bonds are issued that are guaranteed co collectively. Uh, the ECB continues to buy government bonds. Um, and then the incentives to have deficits, of course, continue. And there's more power transferred to an uh, economic government, a uh, European finance minister maybe, so the centralization increases and tax competition will be eliminated and the power of the, cent the central state will not stop to rise. Okay, here with this um, not very optimistic outlook, I, I leave it open to questions. Thank you very much. Vamos começar as, pa a, as perguntas. Yeah, Primeiro, eu estou. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, then. So the, uh, the question is in English. Um, okay, the yeah. question is what are target two imbalances and what would happen when, not if Greece leaves uh, the euro? O que acontece se a Grécia, portanto, deixar a zona do euro? Uh, well, actually, for for the um, for the Portuguese edition, um, I wrote an appendix uh, f uh, on the target two imbalances. What they what they mean? They are just uh, basically um, a reflection of the monetary creation that goes on in in the periphery that is that is higher than in in Germany. So when uh, when in, in Spain an importer gets, uh, gets a loan to, to buy goods in Germany, um, uh, then there arises a target to um, imbalance that is the, because the payment is not ma made directly for, uh, from, 
from the importer to the exporter, then it, then it goes through the banking system in the central banks. So the Bundesbank gets a target two surplus and the Bank of Spain a, a deficit. So, but this is only a reflection of this monetary redistribution. It's good that we have it because then we can, qu we can quantify a little bit how, how these imbalances, how this monetary redistribution goes on. It has been said that now Germany cannot leave the euro anymore because if Germany would leave, then the Bundesbank would have losses, th which is true. Because if, if Germany leaves the euro, they have target two surpluses against the ECB, and then the DMARC would probably appreciate, and this would mean losses for, for the Bundesbank. Um, the thing that I would have to say here is that I guess it's illusory that the 600 billion euros surplus that Germany ha has will be paid um, because the target surpluses are never settled and they could only be paid if once we have um, mm, an import surplus from Germany to the periphery, but then the periphery would have to get more competitive. So the 600 billion basically are lost anyway and they will keep, they will keep increasing if uh, Germany stays within the euro. So what happens, the question goes on, what happens if Greece leaves the eurozone? Um, last November when Papandreou threatened to, to have a referendum on austerity measures, which was a threat to leave the eurozone, there was still exposure to, to Greece. So this was a viable, viable threat, but, but not anymore, I think. Uh, European banks have had enough time to get rid of the Greek debt, uh, to, get it, to get it on the balance sheet of the ECB, or uh, to write it down, or it has been written down already. So uh, I think the Eurozone could, um, um, uh, could survive uh, a, an exit of, of Greece. For Greece, probably it would be not very good if they would not do any reforms. They would probably, they would uh, exit the EU to stop their austerity measures, so they would inflate and the standard of living would fall uh, very much. Uh, on the long term, it might be actually good for the Eurozone because investors would see that it's possible that countries actually leave the Euro and uh, demand higher interests on government bonds from the periphery. Peter Graeber, the, you said that uh, you laugh when people say that Germany benefits from this undervalued euro uh, being very competitive abroad. Uh, assuming that, just a hypothesis, if Germany left the euro by itself, uh, do you think that, are you inferring that the benefits to be out of the euro would uh, surpass the disadvantage of a hugely appreciated currency. What would the effect be? Um, yeah, as, as I said before, the, the DMARC always appreciated. There were harsh mm, devaluations before uh, by, by Italy and, and Spain. Um, um, of course, uh, uh, there would be problems for exporters in the short run, but then they would have to be more innovative. They also would get cheaper their imports. Energy, oil would get cheaper for them because the, DMARC, the new DMARC would appreciate. Um, the great advantage would be, of course, that Germany would not pay any more indirectly <laughs> for the periphery. Um, so they would not, it would not have to guarantee for the debt of uh, of the periphery, the inflation could be lower, uh, there would be, could be more restrictive monetary policy, which is all very good for, in, for long, run, long run growth. Of course, German con consumers would benefit very much, they would have to pay less for, for gasoline, uh, so I guess some of, the ex some of the goods that now goes into exports, German consumers could buy because they, they have to pay less for gasoline for other imports, so they have uh, more money to spend, so they can buy the German cars that go when to when goes to Greece uh, now. We have recently seen a political shift in Europe, 
where parties and political movements that oppose austerity have recently had victories in the polls. How do you see this trend? And if these parties keep winning power and anti-austerity measures keep happening in Europe, what will be the short-term consequence in your opinion? Mm, also, also a good question. Um, this makes the, f the, f the first option that I put on there less, less likely. You know, and this is wh why I always thought that the first option will not really work out because it's not in the interest of uh, politicians really uh, to do that. And um, much, much part of the population is so much indoctrinated by socialism that they somehow think that they could, uh, it would be better for them to, to not have these austerity measures. So um, that these people, uh, yeah, this could actually uh, destroy the euro in the sense that it's, it gets more and more difficult for Merkel to convince its population, her, her population, the Germans, that it's the euro, the euro is a good deal for Germans. Uh, Germans will say, well, if, if Greeks stop austerity measures, why should we guarantee any more or pay more loans for, to, to give more loans to, to Greece? Or if, if Hollande, the fr new French president, um, um, uh, engages uh, or, may, or does not do any reforms or engages in more government spending, the, 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 the same happens. Uh, the result will be people have to finance ever more uh, um, public uh, public spending and inflation rates will, will will go higher and if inflation is double digit for several years in Germany I would think that a, a German exit gets more likely Olha mais uma pergunta ainda dá viu Estou pedindo para fazer mais uma ali atrás aquele this gentleman there Hi mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Bruno, and I think we all can see that uh, ahead of us we have like some kind of crisis in, in the euro. So my question is, what is the importance of gold uh, uh, in this kind of matter? Because maybe, maybe uh, people will realize that the fiat currency is not appropriate to to make uh, another round of it, like all right, let's change the name, or maybe let's change uh, the group that are which one are the members of the European Union. But the same the same problem is underlying. You know what I mean? So what is the importance of gold in the in the next future ahead? Well, um, gold could be play a very w good role uh, for a country that would exit um, the euro. For example, if Greece or Spain would exit the euro, in order for not being a catastrophe for its population, they would have to introduce a currency that is stronger than than the remaining euro. So, euro it could be a gold-backed currency. But, but look, it's not really in the in it's not at all in the interest. Uh, of politicians to have gold-backed currency or linked to gold, or because it's a restriction for government spending. Uh, so I don't see politicians to do it, and I don't actually see the population to be so so educated that they understand the role of gold. They have lived with this paper paper money experiment for such a long time that I, I unfortunately I don't see it happen that we have a higher role of gold um, after, after possible collapse or break down of the eurozone. Muito bem. Vamos então aplaudir aqui nosso convidado, professor Philip Vargas. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. No, you're very Thank welcome. you very Thank much. You.